Thank you so much for taking time and joining us today for this session on creating a strong public interest technology project, applying an equity lens to pit work. There have been a number of conversations across all sectors of society about diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially when it comes to that tech, both the tech field and how tech is deployed. The conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion are even more important and are happening in many more spaces. So today we'll be having this conversation really examining how can we bring an equity lens to the public interest technology work that we're trying to do? How do you, as someone who is interested in the field of public interest technology, who is actively doing work in the field of public interest technology, or who is putting together an application for the Public Interest Technology University Network uh, challenge grant process, think about applying an equity lens to this work? Unfortunately, I'm going to start off by uh, telling you that there's no magic checklist for how to have an equity lens in your public interest technology work. Um, this will not be a just here are 10 easy steps to being equitable in the work that you do. If it was that easy, we wouldn't need this session. Instead, we'll be spending today's session in really examining what does DEI mean? How do we actually think about the right questions to ask? How to build in equitable activities and questions into the design of our projects into the deployment and, and maintenance of our projects as well. And so with that, let's dive in. As we go to the next slide here, I will um, spend some time reviewing the agenda for today. It's a fairly straightforward agenda. We'll start off um, by just going over what is DEI? What does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean? And why does DEI matter in public interest technology? Then we'll examine how do we apply an equity lens to PIT? What does that mean? What are the things that we should be thinking about? From there, we'll go into how can DEI be done by design? How do you build it in to the design of the very fabric of the PIT work that you are doing? And then finally, we'll review our key concepts and we'll end with quite a bit of time, probably about 20 minutes or so, for, question, um, for questions. So again, as was said, if you have questions, please put them into the Slido channel at any point, and we will have, again, plenty of time to go over questions at the end. With that, we'll start uh, with this next section of just getting started with the introduction. So first of all, as we go to the next slide, I'll uh, start by telling you a little bit about myself. My name is Afua Bruce, and I am a public interest technologist. I am a former director of the public interest technology program at New America. I was the director of engineering and was part of the team that co-founded the Pit UN. I'm currently and have been for the past couple of years adjunct faculty at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and I also do a fair amount of strategy consulting in the field of public interest technology. I've also had prior positions in uh, government agencies and working with nonprofits all around the world on how to intentionally design and use technology to advance mission and to uh, care for individuals. And most recently, I uh, co-authored a book with Amy Sample World called uh, The Tech That Comes Next, which examines um, how do we center communities and how do we do this public interest technology work. As we move to the next slide, I just want to uh, recap uh, for everyone here to make sure we're on the same page about what is it, what do we mean when we say public interest technology? So the definition that we use, especially in the academic framework as part of the Pit UN, is that public interest technology refers to the study and application of technology expertise to advance the public interest, generate public benefits, and promote the public good. You'll notice that this uh, field of public interest technology, this definition, creates a space for both technologists and non-technologists to play. That interdisciplinary approach is incredibly important in order to solve the most challenging problems that we have and problems that are truly in the public interest. PIT also encompasses both tech-informed policy and policy-informed tech development. So looking at both how, as people are designing policies, as government agencies, as communities, as corporations even are designing policies, how can tech thinking, tech structures, and the technology design inform that policy making? And similarly, as people are designing different technology solutions, whether it's helping to figure out how people can register to vote or how to protect uh, one's identity in different places and protect against cybersecurity threats, what policies um, are informing that technology development? 
also within the field of public interest technology, it examines both harm reduction and intentional tech development. So looking at how do we reduce the harms that technology can have, whether it's um, discrimination in technology or different uh, emotional or sociological harms that technology can have, but tech pit also creates space for intentionally developing technology in different ways, more inclusive ways and more empowering ways. Uh, public interest technology, this work can be done all across sectors. It can be done in the government sector in the nonprofit sector in the private sector, and of course, in the academic sector as well. And then finally, an overarching thread of public interest technology work and in this public interest technology definition is that pit work should address equity. It should address challenges around justice and challenges around diversity. Um, and so taking all that together, that is the definition that we're working from today and as part of PIT-UN broadly, but as part of the PIT field, what we mean when we say public interest technology. And as we um, then go to the next slide, <clears throat> We'll give the overview here of just what it means to apply an equity lens to the pit work that we're doing. Now, um, over the past several years, back to when we uh, were getting ready to launch the Public Interest Technology University Network, and we convened a number of academic leaders at the time and uh, thought leaders around the field of pit. Those initial discussions that formed the definition that I just went over and that have guided a lot of the work that's being um, done today under the umbrella of pit did reference DEI. They referenced the importance of really thinking about how could PIT be used to help diversify the tech field? How could PIT be used to ensure that technology works for everyone and works for a large groups of people and uh, gets out of the hands of just a few people who understand specific nuances and specific terms and definitions within technology? And so with that uh, framework, it's um, apparent and we'll uh, dive into this more as we go throughout uh, the next hour, that DEI cannot be an add-on. It must occur from design through deployment and even into maintenance. If you um, are working on a public interest technology project, if you designed your whole pit project, you've started on the deployment, um, you're doing the deployment and uh, then you're actually going to be testing the work, and then at that point you say, oh, well, what do I do now for DEI? At that point, it's too late. You've likely already, um, you've likely already found ways to make your technology, your policy inaccessible to certain groups of people, or it won't work for certain people, or it simply will not see or recognize uh, people with different color skin or different genders and things like that. And so DEI cannot be an add-on. It must occur from the design place. It must be intentionally managed throughout the development, the deployment and maintenance of pit work. And uh, just to recap again here, what I, what I said in my opening remarks is that today's discussion really is a framework for how to think about doing this work as you do your own work to think about how you will incorporate DEI. There's not a magic checklist. There are specific strategies that you should be thinking about. There are specific questions that you should be addressing and answering in the design of your work, but there's not a specific just add these three steps and you've magically uh, created a uh, diverse, equity, equitable, and inclusive PIT project. And so as we now go into the next section, um, which is why does what does DEI mean? Why does DEI matter in PIT? Well, I'm going to start on this next slide actually by giving you a little bit of insight into some of the work um, on the, the next slide there. Um, giving you some insight into what some of the work uh, that New America has done when it comes to racial equity uh, specifically. And so New America has spent, um, has spent a lot of time over the past year and a half really looking at what does it mean to really examine what it, uh, what it is to do the work that New America does with a good, a solid racial equity lens. And one of the frameworks that they're using to do that is this cultural competency framework that really gets to learning and really speaking to what is the learning that we're doing, recognizing that different people are at different points in the journey. Um, and so much as we are, as we think about applying DEI 
uh, a strong DEI lens to pit work, recognizing that people are at different places. And so the framework that uh, New America has been using, this cultural competency framework here, starts with um, cultural deconstructiveness and really looking at how do you break down um, some of the terms that people are using, some of the activities that people are using today. And then um, going along there to then uh, move to cultural incapacity and then to cultural blindness, acknowledging blind spots in the organization, acknowledging blind spots in specific projects. And from there, moving uh, along this model and along this framework to cultural pre-competence, and then cultural competence, when people are familiar with the terms, can point them out, can point out the activities, and ultimately to cultural proficiency, when people not just, people don't just recognize the terms, don't just recognize the activities, uh, but actively do the work and actively hold others accountable to doing the work and uh, create a culture where engaging in conversation about the work is uh, welcome, engaging in questioning about the work is welcome, and that cultural proficiency is then really embedded in the culture. And I think uh, that is a strong framework uh, in general for the work that New America has been doing, but also as we think about what it means to sort of collectively, as we're looking at applying an equity lens for PIT projects, to make sure that you're moving yourself, but also the teams of people you're working with along um, a learning framework and along a competency model for the work that you're doing. Now, I'm going to dive in on this next slide into specific definitions of what diversity, equity, and inclusion mean. You probably hear DEI frequently, DEIA, um, other terms frequently, um, but I wanna uh, just take a moment to just go through some solid definitions um, of what we mean when we say diversity, equity, and inclusion. So you can see here that diversity is the presence of differences that may include race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, socioeconomic status, language, disability, age, religious commitment, or political perspective, populations that um, have been and remain underrepresented or, under, or overlooked among practitioners in the field and marginalized in the broader society. So here, when we're saying diversity, we are looking for a diverse range of perspectives. We're looking for um, diversity on a number of different dimensions. It's not just one of these here, um, but really taking into account a lot of different perspectives. And really the question here is actively seeking out who has been uh, underrepresented historically or who has been overlooked historically and making sure that that is designed for and accounted for in what you're doing. Now, equity is promoting justice and impartiality and fairness within the procedures, processes, and distinction, or sorry, and distribution by, uh, of resources by institutions or systems. Tackling equity issues requires an understanding of the root causes of outcome disparities within our society. And so when we look at equity, this is making things equitable. It doesn't necessarily mean making things equal in that if um, someone has 10 of something and two of something, it's not necessarily equal would be giving everyone the same number, an additional five, uh, but equity is making everyone sort of on par. So giving uh, five to the person who had 10 and uh, 13 to the person who had two. Yes, that math uh, adds up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and so that that is the equity that we're looking at, really looking uh, at promoting fairness and justice and impartiality into the work that we're doing. And finally, inclusion is an outcome to ensure those that are diverse actually feel and or are welcomed. Inclusion outcomes are met when you or your institution, your project and your program are truly uh, inviting to all. To the degree to which diverse individuals are able to participate fully in the decision-making processes and development opportunities within an organization or group. And so here, it's, we are moving from acknowledging that we need to have different perspectives, that those diverse perspectives, to moving past uh, making sure that things are equitable, so, so everyone is sort of on an even playing field, to making sure that if we've added seats to the table, if we made that in table uh, more inclusive, so to speak, that it really is inclusive, which means that everyone's uh, who's at the table, their voice is heard, their voice is respected, their voice is given the same weight, and they feel like they can use their voice and really advocate for themselves. That's the inclusion piece. And so here is um, just the breakdown and sort of recap of what we mean when we say diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
And so now as we uh, go to the next slide, just want to acknowledge here that again, the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and really also justice uh, concepts have been embedded into discussions about public interest technology from the beginning. Really, as you think back to that definition that we started with, the phrases there about generating public benefits and promoting the public good really do tie in to these ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, just to recap some of the conversations uh, that have been said about other people who have been in the public interest technology field for quite some time. Uh, Tard Park, who's a former uh, US chief technology officer, uh, discussed how government needs to design for all. And, and in that case, uh, really meaning that it needs to work for everyone in the private sector and some academic sectors or even some nonprofit sectors, people can pick sort of their target market. But if you're designing a benefit system, it needs to be accessible by everyone. Um, and so just really making sure that you're creating that. So that aspect of um, equitable design and equity has been really important there. Cecilia Munoz, uh, Munoz, who is the former director of the Domestic Policy Council under the Obama administration as a current New America senior advisor, um, has spoken quite a bit about how, <coughs> excuse me, uh, PIT is really important because it increases access to services. And here again, we're getting to both the diversity and equity pieces of um, thinking through how PIT is and what uh, can be done through PIT in order to increase access and uh, appropriateness and usefulness of policies um, in order to do that, um, taking into account diversity and equity, excuse me. Uh, and then finally here, I wanted to spend some time um, discussing some of the work of Kathy Pham, who's at um, Harvard Kennedy School adjunct lecturer and has done quite a bit of um, leading work on product and society, really looking at public interest technology there. And um, Kathy Pham there uh, discusses how equity and justice translates to code and the ability for people to be seen by technology. So really interrogating from a technology development process what it means to actually give the right weightings to different variables in your programs to intentionally figure out what different values are between behind different fields and in different forms that you have and what that um, design review process looks like what the code review process looks like and how that ties into equity and justice and really doing intentional checks there around inclusion and so as we go to the next section now, let's talk a little bit about how we actually apply these concepts. We've now talked about um, the definition of public interest technology. We've talked about uh, the definitions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let's talk about how we apply um, an equity lens, especially to PIT. And so to do that on this next slide, I wanna step back actually. And when you are designing your projects, I've actually found it to be most helpful when you start by designing around values and defining what values you have. Now, there are a lot of values to choose from. Um, it should be you know, obviously around uh, things about equity and uh, inclusion especially. Uh, but these six values here are actually taken uh, from the book, The Tech That Comes Next, How Changemakers, Philanthropists, and Technologists Can Build an Equitable World. And these values, I think, really um, create a strong foundation and a strong framework for what then uh, can dictate a lot of design decisions and development and deployment decisions for pit work. And so first is uh, just acknowledging the knowledge and wisdom of lived experience. So really making sure that you uh, value, that you seek out the lived experience of the community, of people in the communities who you are working with and who you're designing uh, alongside as you are doing pit work. And secondly, um, seeking out the participation of a diversity of people in decision-making planning <clears throat> and building technology. And so this is taking a look at who do you have at the table? Is it only technologists? Is it only social impact leaders? Is it only policy makers? Really looking at who you have at that table in making those decisions. Um, it's then also another dimension of diversity as we had from a couple of slides ago, really looking for who are those um, traditionally underrepresented or overlooked populations that you wanna make sure to have as well. And then finally on this uh, stance as well, it's important also here to really think about different levels of the organization and making sure that you're hearing from maybe both executives and uh, your ground level employees there. Also, if you're at an organization that is serving the public, 
um, to have it not just be staff, but also to take members of the community there and making decisions alongside them. <clears throat> the accessibility here as a priority for a start is so important. And this is accessibility in the ways that you might have, <clears throat> excuse me, heard it before in making sure that the website, for example, is accessible, um, that it can be read by people with low vision uh, or things can be uh, turned um, and can be uh, read to people and be made audible. But it also means just the practicality and accessibility of um, doing the work itself. And so if you are saying you're having a community meeting, is it in a place and at a time where people from the community can actually make it to the meeting? Um, this next value that we have here is um, valuing the multiple ways that change is made and balancing the need uh, to address real challenges today with making systemic challenges in the future. Recognizing that there may be big change initiatives that you're pushing for. You may have big visions for your pit project, but also you're going to have to take some baby steps today. Um, these uh, last two uh, values here are really around uh, collectiveness and um, recognizing uh, and balancing individual uh, communities, individual individuals rather, and individual expertise and skills within the community aspect and collectively creating a better world. Okay, excuse me. And so with that, we can move to um, the next slide and uh, you'll notice that I didn't say in that past slide that we're just designing for all and that's because we've used the phrase designing for all it's uh, gotten into the vocabulary I think especially in the civics uh, tech space a while and it's really important uh, but it's necessary but it's insufficient as we really think about bringing a strong equity lens to pit work so specificity matters it is difficult to design for specific communities if you're not clear about who you're designing for. If you think of it from a technical perspective, you're not going to uh, start writing a program to, um, you're not going to start writing any specific tech program without an end in mind and sort of what you're going to do. You're not going to figure out how to uh, add two plus two to get to four without knowing that you want to get to four. That specificity matters and it matters in the design of your projects as well. So as you think about um, bringing an equity lens um, into the work that you're doing for Pitt, uh, make sure to be specific in the groups that you're targeting and the groups you're wanting to serve. Um, the lack of intentional design around this inclusivity and this lack of being clear about what you're doing is really what leads to the unintended consequences that you may hear of frequently when it comes to technology. Um, the unintended consequences in reality are often um, translated to brown and black people or um, women or different continuously uh, underrepresented and overlooked groups are once again left out of the different technology solutions. And so this is why it's important to be specific. And if you are working in um, a community of black women, to name that, if you're working in a community of um, people who are hard of hearing, to name that, but to really be specific uh, and to not shy away from being specific in your design process. Now, we've talked a little bit about um, reducing harm and staying away from unintended consequences, but I want to emphasize that PIC um, isn't just about correcting harm. It's also about proactively creating different, stronger technology and policy. Now, fortunately, we have a lot of positive examples of how this is being done today and examples that we can really build on and um, take some solid lessons from. So as we go into the next slide, I'll just recap uh, briefly uh, three different um, many, many case studies for you, if you will. The first is uh, the organization Code the Dream. We um, talked about Code the Dream. Uh, in the book, The Tech That Comes Next. And Code the Dream is a nonprofit organization that offers free intensive training and software development to people from diverse low-income backgrounds. Um, in uh, Code the Dream Labs, uh, coders work with experienced mentors to hone those skills by building apps and technology platforms for a range of startups, nonprofits, and government 
clients. The ultimate aim of Code the Dream is to create a unique win-win where coders gain real um, experience building apps that make the world a little better um, and then use that experience to launch new careers with enormous opportunity for themselves, their families, and their communities. And so one particular example of, some, of a Code the Dream project is an, a platform called So Much Potential. So Much Potential is one of the many Code the Dream uh, developed platforms built for and by und um, undocumented or DACA uh, mented young people. So Much Potential specifically focuses on resources for students who live in states where status presents a significant barrier to further education. And so what they've done through this platform is to provide resources, to provide a way to easily access those resources and then to leverage those resources. Um, the key here is that they're starting by having members of this community actually be the ones who design this platform. And then also that helps with some of the outreach and the testing and the deployment and making sure that the technology that was designed was appropriate and will actually be used in ways that further the aims in this case of um, accessing education and these educational resources to members of this community. <clears throat> the next example I wanted to give is the one of um, the Rural Community Assistance Program. Uh, so Nathan Ohl was the CEO of the R Rural uh, Community Assistance Partnership, uh, or RCAP, which is a national nonprofit focused on securing and maintaining access to water and economic development for rural communities across the country. It's the nation, it's a national network of nonprofit organizations working to provide technical assistance, training, resources, and support to rural communities across the U.S., tribal lands, and U.S. territories. And although Nathan uh, started by in looking internally for how tech could have a positive um, drive and a positive change within the organization, he began to wonder about ways to impact the farm bill, actually, at the time. <clears throat> and so Nathan and RCAP partnered with New America, actually, and a number of other organizations to convene a day-long innovation summit with a coalition of rural community advocates, nonprofit leaders, and technologists to try out new methods of policy creation. So again, here, really centering the community and really being inclusive, really being equitable, and really um, having diverse perspectives there um, at this innovation summit. So a number of technologists were identified to help structure and facilitate the day. And over the course of the innovation summit, this large group with representatives from multiple communities uh, came up with ideas for a number of programs. And then following this, uh, the summit, leaders of the group advanced the conversations, ultimately conversing with um, congressional staff members about what would become the Rural Innovation Stronger Economy, um, or RISE grant program, which was signed into law. And as Nathan put it, taking part in the policymaking process uh, is made more effective when social impact organizations can build a coalition and advocate to policymakers with one voice. So we see here in this example with RCAP again, that the importance um, and the usefulness and really utility of having diverse perspectives and really doing that at the start in this innovation summit, then driving that through the policymaking process uh, really works well. And then finally, I wanted to highlight some of the work of the uh, New America's New Practice Lab. The New Practice Lab works with government and non-government uh, organizations to help them understand how policies truly impact families in order to improve the delivery and future design of family economic security policies. Last year, the New Practice Lab focused on select policies that disproportionately impact millions of families, um, their access to cash through instruments uh, such as the child tax credit, access to early education and long-term care, and to unemployment benefits. The NPL partnered with government agencies in support of their efforts to engage communities and solicit direct input from families in identifying meaningful ways to change program delivery. From a partnership with the American Association of People with Disabilities to understand and tell the stories of what the disabled community experiences at home, at work, and economically in the face of COVID-19, to testifying before the bipartisan uh, Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress on strengthening the lawmaking process and how data can inform and improve policy, to partnering with the New York uh, Department of Tax and Finance to better understand the factors that present challenges to the administration of the earned income tax credit, the NPL demonstrated and shared lessons 
um, learned on how when you center and engage communities, uh, pit and practice can really move the needle on social issues. So there I think are three solid examples of how really taking this diversity and equity inclusion into the design and building it throughout the work, this pit work um, really paid off and really made a difference in the efficacy of these uh, three different programs. So now let's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, spend some time just going through uh, what are the steps we can take to do this work? What are the steps you can take to implement this in your own work? So we identified here just a simple four-step process. I know I said there wasn't a checklist, but there is this process here that you can go through. And so step one, really defining who the community is that will use and will be affected by what you're designing. And so here, it's really important that you think about just who all those stakeholders are. If you are designing a type of tool for law enforcement, for example, law enforcement certainly is uh, who is going to use that tool, but the communities that in which law enforcement works are communities that will be affected by it. So as you think about defining who that community is and therefore thinking about who you will be designing with and who you need to be whose opinions need to be incorporating into your design process really think about um, the communities that will use and will be affected by what you're designing step two is go talk to the community uh, see what they want see what they actually need uh, they may not speak the technical lingo or the policy lingo that you're used to but living with the issues that they live with they will be able to articulate their needs. And then you can work on what that translation process looks like as you move to step three and modifying any plans that you have already created based on that community feedback and that community input. And then you wanna repeat uh, steps one through three over and over until you really um, have a solid plan for your design, your development, your deployment um, and the maintenance of the work that you do. As we and on this next slide, um, I just want to also give you some uh, questions that you can be asking yourself as you're putting together overall project plans for yourself and as you're putting together overall descriptions as to what the project is that you're writing. If you are writing a project plan for yourself or if you are getting ready, for example, to uh, write and submit an application to the Pitt UN uh, Challenge Grant. Um, so some questions that you might want to ask yourself and really then address in the design of your program are who would be harmed if the technology we build fell, if the technology you build fails? Who will profit and benefit the most from the technology you build? What technologies or services do you not currently have access to, either because of availability or affordability? And what experiences or knowledge do you have that you could share um, for better uh, policy making? That uh, last question. Um, those last two questions actually are questions that you can ask of community members. Once you've defined that community, if you're looking for um, stimulating that conversation, these are some questions you can use from it. I uh, took these questions also uh, from my book that I mentioned earlier. The book actually has about 125 questions total. Uh, so if you're looking for some resources on how to uh, have these conversations, dive into the book. But um, the, these four here will will go a long way in putting together a design uh, for a strong pit project. Um, and then let's go to our last section, um, which is really how can DEI be done by design? So what does it mean to really do that diversity, equity, and inclusion by design? And so I'm going to give you some ideas of some specific activities that you can incorporate um, in order to really address DEI. So as you can see here on the next slide, I have a handful of specific uh, ideas for you. So first is listening sessions. You saw in uh, one of the steps um, on a previous slide um, that talking to the community is important. So listening to the community is important and really structuring some strong listening sessions, um, innovation summits, uh, such as the um, what was referenced in the RCAP example as well, um, can be really useful. Second is inclusion in product design meetings, um, and that can be tied with open prioritizing and review meetings. One of the um, cases that we covered in the in the book, um, the tech that comes next, actually talked about an organization that was a community-based organization rescuing leftover cuisine. 
are in the community, they started out by having people go to a restaurant, to, for example, and pick up leftover cuisine and then take it to people who were facing food insecurity. And as they started to expand and started to use their own, to develop their own technology project, they put the different um, feature requests and bug fixes on one Trello board that everyone could see. So not just staff, but also members of their volunteer community and members of the community uh, who were donating food, for example. Um, and then they used that and they would show there openly and transparently what was going to be worked on and what wasn't going to be worked on. And they were going, they were able to communicate that broadly. That also allowed for people to understand trade-offs that were being made and for the community um, at that point to be able to weigh in to what features would actually be more useful for them or less useful for them. Uh, also important here, um, if you think about specific design and development activities, uh, testing in, a, in the real environment. So um, testing in test environments is great, but if you've uh, built a, a great solution or what you believe to be a great solution and you test it in the comfort of your own home, that may look differently than um, what the people who will actually be using the technology with uh, actually uh, what it'll look like for them on a day-to-day -day basis. So for that, I think of uh, uh, a recent client that I worked with and they had developed this beautiful interface to help people uh, find and access uh, different government benefits um, that worked on a computer. It was designed for uh, people in different uh, government offices or nonprofit agencies to access on the computer. So the thought was that they would go into the office, they'd be on the computers there, and they would access it there. However, when one of the people from this or organization went to the office to do a training for 20 people, they discovered that in this particular office of this uh, partner nonprofit organization that they were working with, there were only two working computers. And so this great interface that had been designed for the computer was completely lost or mostly lost because instead people were trying to uh, do what was designed for, uh, for a computer screen on different phones and phones of various capabilities uh, instead. And so that's um, why it's important to really have that feedback there and uh, do the testing in the real environment. Um, it's also important here to uh, incorporate some of this oversight uh, and these guidelines and oversight boards. And so as you're putting together uh, boards of trustees or different oversight boards, making sure you have members of the community on those boards, making sure that you've got uh, the different diversity, equity, and inclusion aspects and uh, specific people back to that specificity point represented in oversight boards. And that these oversight boards, if you're on one or you think about who you want on your boards uh, to engage with the work that you do, making sure that they will proactively ask these questions around diversity, equity, and inclusion and really centering the work, um, that's really important. And then final, uh, finally, checks for acceptance and approval. So I am a big fan of process because process and structure can actually allow people the freedom then to think about other things when they know what needs to get done. And so here, it's also important to just build into your process checkpoints for acceptance and approval by community members, by the oversight board, um, by looking at and reviewing who's been asked these questions, doing an equity check and using different equity frameworks that are out there uh, on uh, your PIP project as well. Building that in to your design process and into your deployment process is really important. And then once you've designed and developed the activities, uh, the next step is um, sometimes the most fun, uh, which is deploying and, maintain and maintaining the, the work that you do. And so on this next slide, I'll go into uh, just the importance about ownership and maintenance. So when you've deployed the uh, work, whether it's, again, it's a policy, whether it's a specific tool, whether it's a curriculum, um, or whether it's a course, depending on what you're doing, really thinking about how the community that's engaging with this is going to continue to be involved and supported. Where will ownership lie? Who will uh, ask for and be responsible for maintenance or updates in the future? Um, how will you continue to assess a fit and acceptance? What does that process look like? Will there need to be any tweaks further down the line? Uh, what does that overall ownership and maintenance structure look like is really important. And so with that, we'll um, uh, go to the next slide here uh, in one more slide. 
and uh, just recap some of the things that we've talked about today. So to recap, we talked about the definition of public interest technology. Again, it's the study and application of technology expertise to advance the public interest, generate public benefits, and promote the public good. And specifically, when it comes to building a strong PIT project, it's incredibly important, even required, that you have a strong equity lens built into from the start into the fabric and framework for your PIT project. And DEI, it's not just one section of the project, right? It's embedded throughout. Specificity matters. Designing for DEI matters and being explicit in that and the project plans, objectives, and descriptions you have. And then finally, also thinking about DEI through also the ownership and maintenance of projects. Thank you for that, Afua. We have one question from the attendee. Uh, Debbie, who's asking, can you discuss more about the interface between public interest technology and public policy? Yeah, absolutely. So public interest technology and public policy, they can really fall under the same <clears throat> umbrella because again, public interest technology can be about specific technology development, but it's also about the process in which we design policy and the process in which we make policy and the process in which we roll out policy. And so as we think about public interest technology for policymaking, this gets into some of the examples um, really specifically um, from the RCAP example, right, uh, that I went over. And so that's the Rural Community Assistance Partnership example and how they ran a process um, in order to identify specific, uh, what became recommendations for specific programs, in that case, the uh, RISE program, uh, the RISE program for um, into the Farm Bill. And so that uh, public interest technology aspect of that was really the way in which they brought together different perspectives, the way they went in which they um, did some of the brainstorming and used some techniques usually used and reserved for the tech industry in order to spur some innovation, spur some different thinking, spur some conversations and spur uh, the development of specific ideas. And then working with policymakers to then uh, refine some of the policies and to create this program and then handing it over to policymakers to go through that final process of actually passing the legislation that's there. Uh, the other aspect um, there, just to recap again, is some of the work that the New Practice Lab has been doing, um, New America's New Practice Lab has been doing, and that um, is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, that there is just really the importance of um, really centering communities, really centering in the people who, again, use and are affected by those policies in the work uh, that is being done. Um, and then tying that to and really working hand in hand with policymakers to make sure that these policies are created in ways uh, that recognize people and uh, the policies and see people. And that's how we can get to systemic change. Thank you for that. We have another <clears throat> question. This sounds like a combination of agile, user-centered, and contextual design principles. How much of the proposal should focus on the design process? Um, so certainly there are aspects of agile, user-centered, and um, contextual design in um, public interest technology. Uh, so say, you know, public interest technology uh, the name itself and the field itself is fairly new, but it does build on existing other fields, including uh, the school of um, the discipline of STFs, for example, um, and a variety of other uh, disciplines. And so, um, so I just want to acknowledge that. And then to this second question of how much of the proposal should focus on the design process. And here I'm assuming the question is uh, in relation to the proposal for the for any application you may be putting together for the PIT UN um, challenge grant process. Uh, so in the, um, in, the, in the RFP, it does lay out different sections and uh, lays out also, I think, the weights for different sections. And so in the uh, project plan conversation, for example, you will, or response, you will want to lay out the response that you do. Uh, you will want to make sure that in the project plan, for example, it is clear um, what activities you will be undertaking in order to uh, engage the community, for example, what activities you'll be undertaking then, um, what the process will look like 
in your project plan to react to some of the things that the community has said or uh, how uh, you will be accounting for in your project plan, the activities around um, seeking out uh, diverse perspectives and doing um, some work around building in equity, um, building in equity um, and uh, addressing inclusion into your work. So we'll be looking for uh, in that project plan description, some of those activities. Jerry is asking, what failures have you learned from, if any? Oh man, um, there are a number of failures that, that I've learned from. Um, let me quickly think how to anonymize them as to protect the, the innocent or maybe the not so innocent. Um, so I, I can talk um, actually a little bit about some work um, that, that I did during um, some of my time at the FBI and working on, uh, on some different technology development uh, processes. And so at the FBI working on a, doing a review of some technology strategy, for example, uh, worked with a team that had been working for a long time on developing uh, a very specific technology and putting together um, very detailed plans to then share it out to, uh, to the law enforcement community and to community advocates, which is part of the process. Uh, the challenge there is that um, they had gone through nearly all of the de design process and nearly all of the development process. And then we're waiting until the very end to present this to the community. Um, and to the community advocates and to other members of the law enforcement community. And that meeting did not go well. And frankly, it was because all of the design and the development had been uh, done without that community involvement up front. And so it was um, a fairly tense meeting, uh, shall we say, in that case, um, where there were some strong opinions uh, shared by members of both sides, uh, but ultimately it caused um, a much longer design and development process because that team had to go back and had to address a lot of the concerns. And um, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, you can't just add in that at the end. Um, and so a lot of the work had to be redone in order to accommodate um, and to really work with the critical feedback of the community members in that case. We have a few more. So someone is asking, does a specific field of technology need to be identified in the proposal or could the tech slash policy, policy to work on come from the community and change over time? Um, so I would say that the you should provide as much specificity as possible in the application. Um, I think that if you are going to be building in the ability for the community to uh, to weigh in and evolve what solution that looks like. I think that's great. And then articulate what that process is uh, into the proposal. Um, if the technology is already defined and that's where you are, then define and be specific about the decision that's been made and why it's been made in the proposal as well. So uh, as much specificity, whether um, the technology decision as the question asked has already been made, or if the plan is to have a process by which the community gets involved and picks a solution, then be really clear and specific about what that process looks like. I'll also uh, just note that if you have specific questions about your specific proposal that you're putting together, we do have a handful of resources. There is um, an email address uh, that you can send uh, questions to. Uh, there's also an FAQ page and uh, there are also office hours that you can sign up for um, to get specific questions asked. And I'll provide that in the chat shortly. Um, we have another question here. Uh, this presentation focused on projects that design public interest technology as opposed to studying or fostering public interest technology indirectly. Would you discuss the role of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the latter? Yeah, absolutely. So although this presentation uh, may have seemed to have focused mostly on um, technology development specifically, it's certainly applicable to um, studying the technology or studying the field of public interest technology. And so when you think about what it means to apply this diversity, equity, and inclusion framework to that work as well, 
asking similar questions. So in your research design and in the research questions, um, asking the questions and including questions about sort of who is being harmed and hurt by even the research or who would be harmed in, um, or helped by the findings of the research, what that process looks like afterwards, uh, what who is the community um, that will be receiving that research and making a decision based off of it. So if it's uh, the community of, if it's you yourself, um, and that's going to then inform other work that your university could do in subsequent years, um, just being clear about that and being clear about what that process looks like. Uh, really asking about the diversity of your uh, team dynamics of who you are talking to and who uh, is being studied or researched in that process as well, uh, being really intentional to ask those questions as well. So the diversity, equity, and inclusion framework um, does apply to some of the research design itself, as well as um, to who is involved and who to who is involved on many aspects of the uh, research project that you may be putting together. few more here. So someone is asking, I'm also interested in the intersection between this and other community methodologies from the participatory action research and human design, human centered design, sorry. Yes, so I think um, if I understand the question, it's uh, general curiosity about how uh, the public interest technology process or sort of framework uh, emphasizing DEI interplays with humans, um, human centered research and participatory research? Yes, the intersection. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there are a lot of uh, overlap. There's a lot of overlap here. And again, so I would think of it more as sort of public interest technology or PIT just being an overarching framework. And then as you have, and PIT again, having an interdisciplinary nature. And as you bring in people from dis different disciplines, they can bring in their own tools and perspectives to solving that PIT project, to solving that PIT program. And so if you're bringing in someone who is really strong um, at that participatory uh, research side, then using those tools and frameworks to really advance um, the uh, PIT project, again, the, the technology and non-technology aspects and really seeking to um, generate public good and to uh, provide public benefit, then that is great and you should do that as well. So um, I would say the PIT and uh, the participatory uh, research and human centered design certainly aren't in conflict and you often see them working together uh, to execute PIT projects. All right, and um, we have a request from Debbie. Uh, can you provide some examples? I think she was referring to um, examples of the combination of agile, the question around user-centered and contextual design principles. So if you have some examples there to share. Um. Sure. So I, I would frame it as, um, so if you are doing, so the question, uh, just to recap, is what are some examples, maybe how agile is, agile methodology is used within PIT. And so I would say agile is uh, often seen as a uh, development methodology in the tech space um, and for writing code, delivering code, and more. And so how it might look in public interest technology is if you are developing a specific um, tech pro product, you might choose Agile as opposed to Waterfall or any of the other sort of um, uh, design methodologies to manage the work that you're doing. Uh, you could also though use some of the Agile concepts in some of the policy design. And so uh, just the process of sort of iterating on different policy development, I think this is part of um, with some of the work of um, at least one of the new practice lab projects. I think they did some work with uh, family and paid leave last year and the year before 
as well and starting with one small uh, research sprint and going really deep in that research sprint and then following it on with the second uh, research sprint. And so using that sort of agile methodology there to really get to what are the ultimate recommendations, what are the ultimate policy recommendations and policy levers that are to play. And so I think that's um, just recognizing the different ways and sort of ways you can use that agile methodology to both develop technology, but also to develop policy. And finally, to add on to that, maybe we, uh, someone is asking about a, a artificial intelligence example. Sure. Um, so artificial intelligence uh, is definitely, um, there are many, many positive uses and many uh, aspirational uses, I might say, of artificial intelligence when it comes to public interest technology. But I would, I would say here again, what is most, some of the questions that are most important to ask as you are doing any artificial intelligence work is really being clear on what is the problem that is being solved. Is it a problem that actually needs to be solved in general? And is it a problem that needs to be solved by, um, by a computer as opposed to humans? Or, um, you know, used to work at Datakind, used to be the chief program officer of Datakind, which is an organization that does data science and AI in service of humanity. So working with nonprofit agencies and government agencies all around the world. And, you know, some of the other questions that we would really ask at the start of the process to decide if we would even take on this AI project for those questions. But again, really, um, who will be making decisions based on this AI? Is it a standalone tool or is it falling in to some process that a human ultimately, ma um, a human ultimately manages? I think that's a really key distinction and making sure that it's clear there. Also really understanding um, who has the power to turn on system and who has the power to turn off systems is really important. And so, if you're doing uh, an AI solution around, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's say analyzing geospatial uh, data to identify mines in some African countries, which is a project that we worked on at Datakind, and being really clear as to who has the ability to turn that on and turn that off, and are people actually going to make decisions based on what is uh, being done, or is it just going to sort of be left to uh, is the algorithm going to be left to its own devices and not have a lot of oversight? So those are some very key questions that need to be answered before you decide to actually engage in an artificial intelligence project, especially uh, when it comes to pit applications of um, an AI solution. I don't know if we have time for one more last question. This is a really good one related to what you just said. So um, would you propose public interest technology pro projects with international slash transnational aspects to be within the scope? Would you consider that? Um, so I would actually uh, suggest you send that to, um, to the network challenge questions email, which is uh, pit you in challenge at newventurefund.org um, and maybe check the FAQ page. So yes, PIT can be used internationally. There are many examples of PIT being used outside of the US. Um, I think uh, we uh, sometimes even find much more advanced examples of public interest technology outside the US than inside the US. So yes, that is a definite possibility. Uh, but as far as how that will uh, work for a specific uh, proposal for it, the specific 2022 uh, PIT UN challenge uh, grant process. Um, I'd say uh, submit a question so that we can uh, talk in a little bit more detail about your project. I wanna thank everyone for joining our uh, presentation today. If you have any more questions, we will follow up with you via the resources provided in the chat today. Thank you.